every little of grace. Okay, let's come. Let's stand together. Let's come in, into His cause with thanksgiving. Into His gates with thanksgiving and into His cause with praise.
God, Almighty God. Hallelujah. Let's even bow down before Him. Let's even bow our hearts before Him to honor Him, to reverend Him. For there's no other God in heaven, on earth, and under the earth that is worthy to be praised. As the name of Jesus, Hallelujah, Gloria, Glory, Glory, Jesus, Glory, Hallelujah, Glory, and Diana, Psalm four five, verse three. Praise the Lord with most worthy praise. No one for His greatness, no one can fathom. Yes, let's. Praise Him forever. We praise You, Lord. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The city of the God, the holy place. The joy of the He adds us against the enemy. We bow down on our knees. And Lord, we want to leave your name on high. In your unfeeling love, for you alone are God eternal, throughout earth and heaven above. Great is the Lord, yes. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise.
on high And Lord, we want to thank you For the works you've done in our life And Lord, we trust in your unfeeling love For you alone are God eternal Throughout earth and heaven above All the glory is for you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, you are great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, oh, glory. Glory, Lord, thank you for your love for each one of us, Lord. Jesus, thank you for paying the price for our sins, oh God. Father, we just thank you. Lord, we know, oh God, without the remission, without the shedding of blood, oh God, there is no remission for our sins, oh God. We thank you, Jesus that you die you are buried and you rose again that's why we have the hope in you oh God that we can face tomorrow because you are alive oh God hallelujah church you want as we continue to sing this song let it be a sweet incense unto the Lord let it be even from our very heart even to our love for our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Jesus, you are the sweetest name of all. Jesus, you always hear me when I Oh Jesus, you pick me up each time I fall. You are the sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, how I love to praise your name. Jesus. Still the first, the last, the same Oh Jesus You died and took away my shame You are the sweetest The sweetest name of all Jesus You are the soon and coming King Jesus we need the love that you can bring Oh Jesus We lift our voices up and sing You're the sweetest The sweetest name of all oh, Jesus Jesus You're the sweetest name of all Yeah. 
sweetest, the sweetest name of all. Jesus, how I love to praise your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.
say the universe, the maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, glory, glory and honor to you, Lord. All power belongs to you alone. All power belongs to you alone, Jesus, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, the sweetest name of all. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for saving each one of us, Lord. We thank you for your great love for us. Lord, right now, we just commit ourselves to you. We commit your church unto you, Lord. We commit all of us who are called by your name unto you. Lord, you keep our hearts, O oh God, in you, Lord. Lord, no matter what comes our way, Lord, we will be strong. We will be steadfast. We will stand firm because our foundation is upon the rock of Jesus, our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who died for us, the one who redeemed us, the one who has called us out of darkness into your wonderful light. Father, we just thank you. We just commit this entire time unto you. We commit the sharing of your word. Father, we just thank you for your precious word. Lord, heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away, Lord. So, Lord, may each one of us, oh God, open our hearts, open our spiritual ears to hear and not to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. Lord, may your anointing be upon our pastor, Lord, even as he shares forth. Let your word go forth as a two-edged sword, accomplishing what you have purpose for each one of us and for your church, Lord. Father, we just thank you for the wonderful presence, Lord. We thank you for this privilege of being able to come to your throne of grace, of being able, God, even to enter, oh God, to your holy of holies. Oh, what a joy, oh God. Father, we just praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Blessed sister and brother in Christ And uh, I'm glad For those who are online uh, And those who are here Welcome to the sanctuary Yeah, I, I'm glad that we are all here Congregating to praise And to worship Our, our Lord Jesus Yeah, Amen, Amen So uh, this morning Before uh, we have uh, collections for the offering and tithes. I just want to share something about the value of money. Yeah. So you know, money is used as a base, okay, to measure many things, and also for many things in our life. So you will agree with me if I will tell you, money can give you freedom or ability to pursue our dreams or uh, comfort or our security to a certain extent yeah but however working to make money may seem to make a hassle yeah especially when uh, we don't really like the job that we do or we don't love or have a passion in it yeah so uh, but we do it somehow because we are paid in money and that allow us to live our life 
and the value we receive from our labor is merely temporal yeah and or only useful when they are still walking kicking around and breathing on earth so uh, i just want to share the secret how we can convert this money into something that is more wonderful yeah so something that is having an eternal value so this is this beautiful sunday and this is what the secret that i will share with you with the, all our sisters and brothers here and also on those who are, are watching online yeah so actually we can convert the value of our money into food for the hungry or clothing for the poor or support uh, the for the missionaries or churches to continue winning souls for the kingdom of god yeah and every time when we do this we are actually converting the value of money into the heavenly value and our temporal possession is now turned into an everlasting wealth yeah as the word of god says it and put it that way so whatever is given to our lord jesus is immediately touched with the eternal treasures in heaven yeah so it will be like our wise investment to store lasting treasures through our obedience and seeking to honor our heavenly father so i would like to read to you matthew chapter 6 verse 19 to 21 it say do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and lust and rust sorry destroy and where teeth break in and steal but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also thank you lord for your word come let's pray oh our father in heaven i acknowledge that all things come from you and i want to thank you lord as just now the song sang you die and took away all our shame yeah and i want to thank you for the blessing us through our labors on earth where and there are more wonderful things awaiting us in your kingdom that is to come so with whatever labor of our hands we want to give more than we can spare we want to be your good steward who know how to exchange the value that we receive from the labor of our hand into an eternal value so bless our tithes our offerings for the fulfillment of your great mission on earth here and we want to witness more souls to be brought into your kingdom of god bless all the givers who give cheerfully willingly and sacrificially out of our heart in jesus sweetest and most glorious name i pray amen amen Good morning, church. Okay, um, last week we, uh, myself, Pastor Pam, Brother Aaron, and uh, eight youths uh, from the Radical Youth, we went for a mission trip uh, in Thailand, Hat Yai. Uh, so we liars with a small church, uh, small AG church there called Canaan Church, pastoring by Pastor Lily. 
and and uh, and we brought our youth to have an exposure trip, cross culture exposure trip, right? Like have a little bit, a small little taste uh, about uh, doing missionary work, right, in another foreign land. So. Uh, Short mission trips like that, uh, especially for the youth, is an opportunity for them to uh, learn to step up in faith and exercise their faith, and also work in unity together. A lot of time, you know, from a distance, a lot of pers- a lot of people look very nice until you work together. You see true color already, right? And they work in unity, and then gospel-focused kind of lifestyle because that one every single day, gospel is the focus, and also the adaptability. In a cross-culture environment, you know what? All of them tried the some of the Thailand delicacy. They all eaten crickets. They all eaten bamboo worms. Okay, so they have graduated in that area also. So before we watch the overview of the video about the mission trip, uh, we want to uh, have this time to listen to some of their experiences uh, about the trip. Okay, so the first one I think I would like to invite is Brother Josh. Followed by Geraldine, Edward, and then Gen C. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So I, right now, today, right now, I just want to take the opportunity to thank God for His protection, His provision, and also um, the whole journey uh, throughout this mission trip. So, first of all, I want to thank God for everything first. Thank God for the food fair and also all your generous contribution that made our food fair so successful that we achieved above our target. So, thank, thank you everyone for that. And I also want to thank all the pastors, um, all the pastors and the mission team that we served together in this mission trip, in this battlefield. It's a very new experience for me. And alongside with all your prayers for us. Thank God for the journey mercy to and fro. It's a very bumpy journey and for the good weather too. Okay, so right now I would like to share the challenges. So the first challenge I have is the air quality there is pretty bad and it contributes a little cough for, for me on the first day, on the first day itself. Starting already, I have cough already. And I think that wearing masks, taking vitamins can help a bit. But end of the day, it just got worse. And the, set, and, the, and the scary part is, I'm actually supposed to share and the cough is actually something that stops me from sharing, like not so smooth anymore. So yeah, the first day was okay. The second day, it got a bit worse. The third day, I KO. Really KO. On the third day, right, my body was so weak and I had a high fever on that trip. Literally, high fever as in laying down on a bed, cannot move. And yeah, I could not share at all. Literally, I could not share. And then I really thank Pastor Pam for stepping in for me. So we have to adapt to all these changes. And I was really praying that I, there's only, there's four days, right? So on the third day, I was KO already. So I was praying that on the fourth day, at least, I can still stand up and share again. I was just praying that because I really want to just share what I prepared. <laughs> yeah. So I thank God for Pastor Kevin, Pastor Pam, and all the youths, right? When I was on the bed, they were so busy, yet they were still caring for me also. Yeah, b- despite of their busyness in their schedule. Mm. So, yeah, I praise the Lord that the recovery was faster than my usual recovery duration. For example, yeah, my usual intake of like Panadol. And yeah, and takes a few days, normally a few days to a week for me to recover. But this time, I want to give God all the glory because only a few hours that I'm able to be healed. And not only that, I was able to share on the fourth day. Yeah, thank God, praise God for that. And another challenge, another challenge, the first challenge was said already. Another challenge was the preparation for the sharing of each session. This is a very big challenge because there are some sessions, right? Because there are some sessions are longer, some sessions are shorter. Because the audience can be from children, youth, adults, and until old folks. I have to prepare like the spectrum of that, so many. And one of the scary part of the mission trip, 
was the timetable was super super flexible. For example, the time for Ovoks home right is from like two to five, and then on that day itself, they only give us one hour, two to three. So we have to squeeze everything. We have like all the other programs, not just my sharing. So I have to squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Then the sharing right itself is was a challenge to prepare. Not only that, you know the primary school. They say primary school in the schedule, but it says primary school. But when I go there, I see the children are kindergarten. Wow! Then I like I prepare this for them, like the the level of understanding, right? Wow! I have somehow need to change that the, on that spot, and the preparation was so intense on the first and second day. For example, ten to fifteen minutes. I I need to prepare ten to fifteen minutes only initially. I prepare half an hour to forty minutes, and then I was into short, short, short because the hard part is I want to share about the salvation. I don't want to cut off the salvation, right? And I need to squeeze into ten minutes. And at this one, I really pray to God to, for me to the strength to see me through for the first day and the second day, because that was the the bulk of the sharing. Then I also want to thank God for the translator also. Yeah, the translator really language barrier is one of the big obstacle, and all by God's strength. Seeds are sown, and salvation is preached. That's the main main thing that、uh, I want to share. And yeah, lastly, I want to share what valuable lessons I learned from this trip.、Mm, the first one, fully trusting God to move hearts in every situation. For example, God works actually beyond what we can see and what we can understand, and God works in the hearts of people. We just, for my part, have to take the step of faith. To do our part the best, and God will do the rest. For example, in the old folks' home, right? It's like I share, I share whatever I prepared, and by looking at the reaction of the audience, they are like, okay, they're just staring at me, like clueless. Yeah. Then after that, the end of the sharing, I I actually ask them, do you want to accept Jesus in your heart? And then I like I like wait for a while, and then one hand shot up. Just one hand shot up, and I believe all heavens rejoice. And we, and I, and the team, we sh- we go to that person, the man, and we pray for that person, the man. Yeah, it was so、um, awesome because it's like that one person made my day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> give God all the glory for that. <laughs> and the second thing to learn from this trip is learning how to adapt to t- changes. Changes.、Mm. Sometimes what we plan right in our lives doesn't go our way. For example, I plan the seven seven、uh, pages of script. End of the day, I have to shorten it into two pages. <laughs> two pages, and the two pages due to time constraint, I prepare like all the all the、um, examples, theory, justifications, and theological argument. Right, but end of the day, I have to just to share the salvation part. Yeah, and actually, it's just a simple message, right? With God's word, can change lives. No need to be so elaborate, actually. And let God change the hearts as we do our best to share. That what I did. And about the translator, we had two translators: one from English to Thai, one from Chinese to Thai. And we don't know sometimes which one can be available. I only prepare my script in、uh, English. If suddenly Chinese, right? Wow, susa. So that one, I really need to like be prepared. But thank God, it's all in English. <laughs> yeah. So that is the thing I learned how to adapt to these kind of changes during in a mission trip. Last one, and the best one, God's healing is always great. I was once sick, and then I was once healed. I was healed to share the word. I give God all the glory. <laughs> last thing, last but not least. One of the highlights in the trip, just one of the highlights. So, we pray for the Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of people, and it broke the spiritual chains of two children, brothers and sisters. This one, okay. So, on the third day, the boy, yeah, one brother sister. So, the boy, Pastor Kevin, dealt that boy dealt with that boy on day three. He wanted to accept Christ. So, Pastor Kevin cut off literally the scissors, cut off. And remove all the pendants and braces. And on the fourth day, the sister came. I prayed. This one I prayed for the sister, who came on the fourth day. And I just shared a simple salvation message. 
simple salvation message because she's only like primary one and uh, like kindergarten that kind of age and she wanted to cut it off too and I, and I cut off the braces and we give God all the glory there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain Amen Thank you everyone That's all for me Thank you everyone Hello oh. Morning everyone So today I would like to share uh, We have four points And my first point is What were the challenges I faced In the mission field I think the main challenge I faced in the mission field was the language barrier. There were many times where I felt that I really wished so badly that I wanted to speak uh, their language in order to communicate with them. Indeed, we were blessed with translators, um, but even with a translator, there were many times when I felt that the translator didn't fully like get what we are trying to say because we said such a long English sentence and then she just translated it in a short Thai, Thai phrase and I felt very uncomfortable is she, is, is she shortchanging the people that we are sharing to? so my second part how did I overcome this challenge? I learned to trust God and I was reminded that even our translators did not come by accident or by coincidence. They were appointed by God to be there with us. And whatever message they conveyed, I have to trust that God is using the translators that He has provided to move every heart that is listening to our message. So, my point number three. What is a valuable lesson that I have learned from the mission trip I think there's a lot of mess- a lot of lessons but one of the main ones that s- struck out to me was that language is a connection and being able to communicate in the mother tongue of the country will make sharing the gospel very much easier and even before the mission trip I was personally I was already interested in language studies but now that I've seen like first hand the impact and the great advantage of learning another language I, I really, I'm really motivated to learn more languages and today I'm starting <laughs> my USM orientation so I'm planning to minor in Japanese and also Thai yeah yeah because I see, I see now there's I really want to be a mediator of the gospel to different language groups and to reach the unreached. So my last point, uh, what am I thankful for? I'm really thankful for our pastors. Honestly, without them, I think I'll get lost. <laughs> because they were watching out for us like and making sure we were safe. And I really want to thank Pastor Kevin uh, and for liaising with Pastor Lily. Like, although um, we don't see, but I believe that they spent a lot of hours just going back and forth, trying to uh, make sure the, the locations were uh, available for us to go to. And I also want to thank for Pastor Pam um, for being like a motherly figure <laughs> to like make sure we are all okay, all, all the girls are okay and also all the guys are okay. And I believe that uh, our pastors, they are already seasoned in like ministry and mission work and they knew what to do obviously. They knew how to conduct all, all of the activities it's probably very easy to them but I really thank them that they restrain themselves they hold themselves back and they allow us uh, to step out of our comfort zone and to learn because there were times that we didn't know what to do <laughs> and seeing uh, obviously they know what to do but they they held themselves back and I'm really thankful for the opportunity to to learn uh, and I also want to thank Pastor Lily uh, who is the pastor of the church that we stayed at uh, she was very hospitable she cared for us and she made us feel very welcome and she also translated uh, the, from the Chinese to Thai yeah, for, a num- uh, for us a number of times and I'm really amazed at her zeal like she's, she's like a one like a single woman 
and she's very small honey <laughs> and she's all alone actually she's even shorter than me she's all alone oh that yeah over there the brown color shirt yeah and she's all alone and it's i can't imagine the zeal that she has that that uh that compassion that love for her community but she can do this ministry for so many years 10 over years i i'm really amazed i'm really touched by her her service and her zeal and it really what what she what she did right, what what she was doing there is more than any sermon i can really think really think of because it's just her life it's her life that really was an inspiration and i hope that our church will also continue to uphold her ministry and her her work in prayer so that god will continue to use her in thailand and lastly i want to thank all our sponsors uh, everyone who contributed small or big because we would have to fork out <laughs> a lot of our savings um, if it wasn't for you but we really thank you uh, because you have contributed you have greatly eased our financial burden uh, and i really thank god for you and i really pray that god bless you bless you abundantly because of what you have sowed into the kingdom of god with your resources okay so that's all thank you so good morning everyone um church today i have been given a task to do hmm yeah so i have to share with you all what are the things i learned as i went on the radical youth mission trip so there were few challenges i faced and lessons i learned along the way but one of it taught me to minister better and vote for jesus mm-hmm. so the big barrier for me to get out of that comfort zone is i have public uh public speaking fear i have fear of speaking in public so i was afraid to share my testimony of speaking how jesus came into my life how he loves me and how he loves all of them there the little kids so um i was truly nervous at the time to speak about jesus then only i was realized um reminded not to be shy when i am doing it for jesus because when we want to do it for god glory we will not be the one doing there but holy spirit will be helping us he will be with us guiding us one by one so just like acts 18 9 says this mission trip taught me to be bold for jesus not to be afraid to keep on speaking and not to be silent when it comes to sharing the word of god the gospel and when it comes to ministering for jesus Yes, it was totally out of my comfort zone, but God helped me to do it. And it's all glory to God alone. So, thank you so much, Church, for keeping us in your prayer uh, as we were preaching in another country. So, the good news is that the mission report is mission success. Okay, that's all from me. So, all praise and glory to God alone. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jan C and I'm the daughter of Brother Joseph and Sister Subat. <laughs> and one of those who went to Hat Yai for mission trip. Today I want to share and testify of all the goodness that God in, did, do, did in those three days of ministering to the people there. First of all, this was my first time leaving Malaysia and I have never been to school before. So I made it to Hat Yai and made it back here safely. So praise God for that. There are a few things that I learned there. So the the place that is very open, very welcoming, and very extroverted. We ministered to most of the children there, and they were so extroverted, so welcoming, so open, so excited. As for me, I also have a pub, uh, I also have a fear of public speaking, especially to the kids. And to interact with them is my first challenge. So I prayed, and I was so nervous to interact with them because I'm not a good communicated with children uh. so i prayed and i prayed uh. but then uh, this is the first thing that i learned our weakness our fears can go against god's plan 
our fears and our weakness is made perfect in His power. And the second thing that I learned there was um, our testimonies can impact people's life. There was this one ministry when we had to go to the neighborhood children, the basketball court, and we worship together, we play games, they watch a short drama and all. And after that, when everything was going right, when everything was going smooth, it started to rain. When it started to rain, the parents started to pressure them to come back up. So we directly asked, who wants to accept Jesus? I think all of them raised their hands. In fact, all that they heard was just two testimonies. There was not even time for sermon, and they accepted Jesus. <coughs> there was this other ministry that touched my heart. The, the, this was the Orfox home. When they were, we worshipped together, they watched a short drama, introducing the sermon, got the testimonies, everything was going right. I was expecting all of them to raise their hands. But then the first time, they were all just so silent. I was so disappointed and I was so discouraged. But then just standing from the corner there, watching only, I felt so discouraged. But then suddenly one old man in the middle raised his hand. And that also was very disappointing for me. I was expected to get excited to see that one man raising his hand confidently, not hesitantly. But witnessing that later on showed me that day that the whole heaven rejoices just for that one person, but I am disappointed. From, from this I learned that whatever we do, we cannot expect more people to come. But for one person, the whole heaven rejoices so that we should also rejo rejoice together. So what some valuable lessons that I learned from this mission trip. Number one, His power is made perfect in weakness. From the Bible, I know that Paul says that he rejoices when he is weak, when in persecution. Because right, when, we are, when he is strong, I mean, when he is weak, he says he is strong. Just like that, because we think when we are strong, right? Because we think we are strong, we usually make a mess because we know that we are good enough, we can do it, we have enough experience. But when we leave it to God, we tell we are not uh, strong enough, we are weak, we need God to come, He comes on us and everything that He first started in us, He finished it and accomplished it. In. The second thing that I learned right, on this mission trip, God doesn't look at things like we do. His perspective is different from us. I look at that one man and I got disappointed. But He saw that one man and He rejoiced. Like, right, from the many times in the Bible, we saw a young, maybe a weak, maybe a timid shepherd boy. But he saw a king for Israel. And just like that, with that same example, I also learned another thing. When David was anointed as king, as king, he did not become proud. He did not say, oh, I'm now king. I can sit back and relax. I can go and conquer right away. I can do things my way. I can have wealth. I can have fame. But no. What he did was, he waited for his time to come. He continued to shepherd. When his enemies overpowered him, he left God to avenge and he stayed down. And that was humility. Why we need to walk in humility? Because we think, right, we are good enough. So we need to know that God did it through us and we did not do it. We are merely just vessels. So let us be completely empty and let God completely complete us in perfection. Last but not least, I want to thank Pastor Pam and Pastor Kevin for taking care of us, for providing for us the pocket money, and for protecting us. When I made dumb mistakes, they did not fail to encourage me and teach me. So thank you, Pastor Pam and Pastor Kevin, for protecting us. I also want to thank the parents who trusted God to send all of us away to Hadyai alone for the first time, not even been to school. So I want to thank all of you parents for doing that. Thank you for saving for us. Thank you for praying for us. And not to forget, I also want to thank all of you for contributing to this mission trip, for the expenses of this mission trip. May God bless you all. And above all, I want to thank God graciously for giving us the freedom to preach there in Buddhist primary schools, all Buddhists, for giving us the freedom. If we preach here, we get in lockup. But when we preach there, it was freedom. And thank God for saving many souls, for providing for us, for protecting us, and for preserving each of us to serve in unity. Thank you, and that's all from me. I'm Kevin, son of Robin and Lily. 
Okay, um, uh, joke aside, okay. Um, yeah, I mean the team really did very well. Okay, uh, really give God all the glory. You know why the old folks home only one hand raised? Because all the other already accepted Christ. <laughs> all the others already accepted Christ. And, and to raise hand together, compared to no one is raising hand, you raising your hand, that take courage also. All right, we thank God for all the things that is uh, going on, happening. And even for Joshua, I was quite worried for Joshua. And on the third day, I see him, his face changed lying down. Yeah, I also texted Brother Vince, uh, pray for your son and all. But amazing. <clears throat> I told Joshua, don't worry about this, you just rest. Yeah, if to, to, today, I mean, on the third day is the camp. I said, the camp, you cannot take it. Pastor Pam will take the camp. Sunday message, I will take over. You just rest. Then he, okay, he just rest. But he said, I want to, I want to. I said, yeah, we pray for you. So we pray for him also. Then after that, one night, the next day, not even next day actually, I think somewhere during evening time, he's already okay and still followed follow us out. But morning, he's like, <clears throat> just lying down, didn't talk and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. I mean, God is amazing. Right? God is amazing. And talking about the uh, <clears throat> cutting the pendant and all these things for the kids. Before cut, I checked with the kids. I said, all this is actually belong to the idol. You belo belong to Jesus. So all this, you don't need it. You can take it off already. Is it okay for you? Then he said, okay. Then I also checked with the pastor. Uh, is it okay? Uh? Will he go back? Uh, can I cane or something like that? You know, this, so I say, no worry, I will deal with the parents. I say, okay. So, are you, you sure you be belong to Jesus? And Jesus is your Lord. Means he's, take, he's the one in control of your life from today onwards. Then he say, yeah. So after that, we cut, cut, pray for him. Then the next day, not only he didn't get scolding or what, he, bring, he brought his sister. Both first time come to the church. And because of what happened to him, he brought another person the next day. And that reminds me and reminds all of us something very important. You know, our chains are gone. You know, we, we experience uh, 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 the, the grace of God and the love of God. We too, we need to be reminded it's time to bring someone who do not know Jesus to come to the place to listen to this good news of God. Amen. Thank you for contributing. Thank you for all the generosity. Thank you for uh, your prayer uh, or any of your support in any other way. We give God all the glory. Thank you very much. Thank you, church. <clears throat>
Are you blessed through all the testimony given by our missionary? <laughs> Can we give Jesus a baby hand? <laughs> Amen. Amen. We have heard four speakers already, so today will be the fifth one. Are you tired? Huh? Amen. Now, can we stand to our feet? Yeah, at least go to a few people and give them, give them a very gentle handshake that you would ever given to a lady. Can you do that? Yeah, please do that. the Lord. Now just now Jen Sia was saying that you know that you know she was nervous when she was there you know let me tell you that all of us pastors uh, we seems okay but we are not we are very nervous also <laughs> okay today uh, let's turn to our Bible to the book of Luke Luke chapter 16. Now my text is actually from verses 1 right down to verses 13. Okay? Luke 16 verse 1 to verse 13. And I got three points right here. From verse 1 to verse 8, first point. Verse 9 to verse 12, second point. The last point, only one verse, verse 13. Okay? Now we are going to read only one verse. Because it's a long passage, I'm going to read only one verse. Ready? Luke 16, verse 1. Verse 1 says, He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had what? Who had what? A steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man, who was this man? It was the steward. Was, was what? Wasting his goods wasting what his good that means wasting his money shall we pray amen father today we give you all the praise all the glory for what you have done in hajai thailand thank you for all the youth the young people that be released they have been released from this church by their parents and also by you to go there to minister, Lord, your word, 
to the children, to the young people, to the old folks home. Father, we thank you for all the wonderful testimony that we have heard. Indeed, you have done a good job, a wonderful work right in the hearts of those people. And we pray for all those souls that have given their life to you will bear fruits in the days to come. Some of them may rise up to become leaders of the church and they may be even pastors. Lord, we give thanks. And today, we want to pray for your word. We want to pray for your rich anointing will rest upon me and upon the hearers. I commit myself to you and I pray in Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. All God's people say, Amen. And amen. Praise God. Now, my title today is found at verse 8. Uh, verse 8. Can you see the word? The unjust steward? That will be my title. Right? The unjust steward. Now, as far as the parables of Christ uh, were concerned, this is considered one of the hardest, one of the hardest of Jesus' parable to interpret and also to understand. So therefore, I need God's grace. I need God's help uh, to explain uh, this parable to you. Okay, the first point. The first point is, I want to talk about the purpose. The purpose of the parable. Verse 1 to verse 8. The purpose. Now, what is the purpose of the parable? If you look at verses 1 right down to verse 13, what is actually the punchline? What is it that Jesus was trying to convey to all of us? If you want to understand what is the purpose of the parable, you look at verse 8. Verse 8. Right? That's the purpose. Verse 8 says, So the master commanded the unjust steward because he had dealt strudely, strudely or wisely. So that's the purpose of the parable. Now I'll explain on that. But let's look at verses 1 to verse 8 first. Number 1, we are going to look at the person. Now, there were two main characters found in verse 1. Who were the main characters? Number one, we saw a rich man. Am I right? A rich man. Uh, found in verse 1. So the Bible say he was rich. Then number two, we also understand that he was a responsible man. Why? Because the Bible says at verse 1, this rich man only appointed, only hired a steward to be in charge of his big estate and land. So this steward must be a very responsible person. Am I right? If not, this rich man will not hire that one man to be in charge of everything. So we have touched on the person. Now let's look at second point. The problems. Look at verses 1b to 3. Verses 1b to 3. Firstly, let's look at verses 1b that he was discovered. Look at verse 1b. He says, And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So that's the problem. He was discovered. Now this is very, very bad, isn't it? For example, you did something that is very bad in the office, at the workplace. Nobody knew about it. Then somebody came to know about it and reported it to the boss. That is exactly what happened right here. This man did something that was wrong. 
he was wasting his master money and goods nobody knew but then he was discovered now the word if you look at verse 1 the word wasting uh, in a new kjv or waste what does that mean it means you this uh, particular steward spend the money carelessly wasting what was belongs uh, to the boss so this is exactly what you find in the life of the prodigal son it says in luke 15 verse 13 he journeyed to a far country the prodigal son and there the word is wasted his possession with prodigal living means with wild living that means he just spent carelessly used the money carelessly uh, to no purpose so that's called wasting now you and i are in the same shoe today we are what we are stewards we are also managers managers of what god has given to us just like the boss, the manager here, the boss here, gave to the steward uh, to be in charge of his possession, in the same way, God has given us everything. Right? We have a life. We have a job. We have a home. We have money. We have possession. We have asset. We have this body. Am I right? God has given to us. To be in charge. We are like stewards. We are like managers. Well, we can do two things. One is we can, if we can manage it properly, then you'll bring glory to God. Now, if we manage it wrongly, just as what verse 1 says, wasting the master's goods. That means wasting God's resources. What happened? One day we're going to stand before God and give an account of ourselves to Him. And that is what we read here. So he was discovered. Next thing, he was dismissed. Look at verse 2. So the boss called him and said to him, What is it that I hear from you? Give an account of yourself. For you can no longer be my steward. Now that is devastating, isn't it? Uh, you're working for many, many years. All of a sudden, the boss called you to his office and sack you and asked you to leave uh, the job once and for all. That was what this man faced. Then the third thing we see in the story here is that he was dismayed. He was discouraged. Look at verse 3. Look at verse 3. The steward said within himself. In other words, he kept everything to himself. And what did he say? What shall I do? For my master is taking my stewardship from me. I cannot dig. I cannot what? Back. Now, in this verse, verse 3, you see three things this man said about himself. Number one, he said about his stewardship. His stewardship will be taken away from him. That's number one. Number two, he talked about his strength. Do you see that? Right at verse 3, he said he cannot dig. That means he don't have physical strength. Then number three, about his shame. He says, I'm too shameful to dig. So here you can see his problem right here. And how he's going to solve it. How he's going to do it. And that's where we come to the third point. We we'll touch on the persons, the problem. Now we look at the plan. This man came out with a plan. What was the plan? The plan is described right at verse 7. 
right down to verse 7. And this was what the owner of the land commanded on this steward for being shrewd, for being wise. So we're going to discover what was this plan. It says here in verse 4, he says, I have resolved what to do. You see, when men face problem, you must always find ways to solve it. And that's talking about the people of the world. Even Christian in a church must also do the same. When we face problem, don't just get discouraged. Don't withdraw yourself. Don't go to your room and then cry until huh, the end of the day. Then continue huh, with, with your life, huh, with depression and so on and so forth. But here you can see that this man came up with a plan. He says, I resolve what to do. Bear in mind, he don't even have advisor with him. You know, no advisor. The boss just kicking out, just abandoning him, just like that. But yet verse 4 say, he knows what to do. He says what? I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the job, stewardship, verse 4 says what? They may, who is the they? Talking about somebody. That they may receive me into their houses. Who were the they? The they actually refer to all the master's debtors. The master debtors. So we have, number one, verse five, the call. He called everybody uh, to come all the master debtors to him. Then the next one we see was the cut. Verse 5, B to servant. There were many debtors that came to him. The Lord Jesus only singled out two out of the so many. So he spoke to the first one. And what did he say? How much you owe my master? He says, 100 measure of oil. Now in those days, it, 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 you know, it was about two to three years wage, uh, wages. Uh, two to three years of wage. He says, 100 measure of oil. So he said to him, take your bill. Sit down quickly and write 50. That means 50% discount. Then over here he says, then he said to another, verse 7, how much you owe? He said, 100 measure of wheat. Then he said to him, take your bill and write 80. That means 20% discount. So here you can see what? A win, win, lose situation. The debtors win, of course. Right? Paying less. Who don't want? Everybody wants, right? Pay less on your debts. The other person that win was this man. This man. Then who lose? It was the boss. The boss lose. So it's a win, win, lose situation. So if you look at the call, the card, now the next one is the chase. Chase, chase on what? It's a chasing of time. Why? Because if you look at verse 1, the owner said, the owner said what? Verse 2. Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be my steward. In other words, that very day itself, look at verse 2. The boss, the owner, wanted an account to be shown to him at the end of the day. So when he hear that he's going to be fired, at the end of the day, he has to bring in the cow, he's fighting for time. He only got a short, short time to do it. One of the key things, one of the key notes is you can see at verse 6. He told them to sit down quickly. Can you see the word? Quickly. Do it fast. Why? Because time is constrained. Time is short. He has to come up with an account, and with an account, he got to submit it right to his 
boss. And that's what we see here concerning the person, the problems, then the plan, now the praise. Very strange when you look at verse 8. A lot of people, when they look at this parable, they were all scratching their head. How can, verse 8 say, how can the owner of the land commanded on this particular so-called unjust or dishonest steward? By the way, whose money did this man use? He was using the boss money. Am I right? If he cut down the money by percentage, it was the boss that lose the money. It was not him. And look at the praise right here, verse 8. That's what Jesus was trying to drive something right to each one of our hearts. Look at verse 8. What did the master say? Verse 8. So the master commanded the unjust steward because he had dealt strictly or wisely. Now, how can a master say like that? Isn't it? And if you read the scripture, or if you are in the same shoe, how would you respond? How would you respond? People are using your money. Will you comment? Will you condemn? Will you get angry? Which one? Definitely, I believe most of us will get upset. We'll get angry. But we never read that right at verse 8. Verse 8, it says, This man, this master, commanded on the unjust deal because he had done strictly or wisely. And this is what we want to see here. Why the master said this man was wise. What do you think? Why the master said this unjust steward was wise? In what way he was wise? Anybody knows? Of course, very hard to know. Am I right? Huh? Right? But I tell you, the story, the story, when you read the story on the surface, you cannot get the answer. The answer is actually embedded right inside it. And what is it? Why this boss or this master commanded on the unjust word that he has done well or done wisely or done strictly? The reason is because the master said, this man is very special. This man, knowing that his time is very short, and yet this man plan. This man also have foresight. He look right into the future. You understand? That is what we see right in this story. He came up with a plan. So that he can use the master's money in favor for himself. In favor for who? For himself. To gain favor in the sight of all his debtors. So let's look at verse 4 again. Verse 4 gives us some insight to the story. It says here that when I'm put out of the stewardship, that they may receive me into their houses. So this man actually has a plan. If I help the debtors right now, they are going to take care of me later on. Like a favor return. Do you understand? I've done something good to them. Now, in return, they will also help me. Now, we need to ask ourselves this. Are we wise or not wise? Especially those of you who are of age. The time is limited. Am I right? Once you're above 60, you're closer to the grave. You're also closer to heaven. And that's where we see here in this story the similarities right there. 
Now look at the scripture, Luke 16. It says very clearly, am I right? Luke 16, it tells us huh, that we need to plan for our life. Now look at what Jesus said, right at verse 8. After the master commanded the unjust steward, because he had dealt truly, then Jesus added something. Look at verse 8. What did Jesus say? Verse 8. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. What was Jesus trying to mean? He was doing a comparison. That the son, the children of the world, is more smarter, is more wiser than the children of light. That's the Christian. In in the context of verse 8. You look at non-Christian today. Do they plan? Yeah, all of them plan. They plan for this life. They make sure they got saving, got empty, got investment, then they got money, right? And they make sure that they can retire early. Many youngsters say like that. They want to retire early so that they got enough food to eat. That will last them right until the end of their life. So most of them, the people of the world, all plan for this life and never plan for the future. When come to Christian, it is almost like that. Why I say that? Because Christian be in the world, they become part of the world. And they behave exactly like the people of the world. They also plan for this life. And they forget about the next life. Am I right? How many of you actually plan for next life? Hardly any. We think on this life. We never think about the next life. Why did God give us this parable? It's to warn you and I that the day of reckoning is coming. Just like this steward. He has to face his master. We have to face our God. Our time is short. From sunrise, we receive the message. By sunset, we have to submit in the account. You understand? So the question is, are you wise or not wise? That's the story. That's the punchline of the story. Now look at point number two. So we know the purpose of the parable. Now let's look at point two. The promises in the parable. Verse 9 to verse 12. Verse 9 to verse 12. So some of you will ask another question. How can I be wise? Am I right? How can I be wise? Well, our Lord Jesus gave us some promises. From verses 9 to verses 12. The promises. And don't miss the promises. This is where Jesus begins to teach the disciples. If you look at verse 1, he was teaching the disciples. And also hoping the audience, beside the disciples, hoping the audience. They were the Pharisee right there. Also hearing the message. If you don't believe that, you look at verse 14. Verse 14. Now the Pharisee, who were what? Lovers of money, also heard all these things. And they were derided of him. They were laughing at him. But the verse 14 says, Pharisee were there, also hearing the whole thing. But they themselves were the what? Lovers of money. Can you see the emphasis right there? So Jesus was teaching the disciples at the same time. He was hoping that the Pharisee will also hear the message. Because sometimes Christian, this is a warning to all of us, Christian, sometimes we love money instead of loving God. Hmm? Yes. So that's the message that we see here. Now what are the promises that our Lord gave us? In the usage of our money, God promises something. If you use your money 
wisely, this will be the blessing. This will be the promises that God promises each one of us. Now the first one, the usage of money is what? You call it the investment in friendship. That's found in verse 9. Look at verse 9. And Jesus said, I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. That when you fail, that means when you die, uh, when, all, when your life fail you, that they may receive you into the everlasting home. So when you look at verse 9, the first thing is Jesus is trying to tell us, he says what? Make friends for yourself by using the unrighteous mammon. Now why Jesus used the word unrighteous? Mammon means money in New KJV. And in fact, he said it two times. You can see that at verse 9. I think you also see that at verse 11. Why did our Lord talk about money? He didn't say righteous money. He said unrighteous money. Why? Use money in the right way. But why he call it the unrighteous money? Because today, look at the world. People can use money in all sorts of ways. Am I right? Everybody work and do all because of what? All because of money. In the name of the money. Let me cite a few examples for you. What about the area of prostitution? Also money. What about theft or stealing? Why people are covetous? Why there's human trafficking? Why there's a scam, scamming? Right? Why there's robbery? Why there's gambling? You name it. Why there's problem in marriages? All has to do with money. Why divorce? Why fights? Why there's all so many things that are going around in the world? All because of what? All because of money that's why the bible talks about the unrighteous mammon the unrighteous mammon but for christian we can use the unrighteous mammon in the right way not in the wrong way but in the right way how to use it in the right way that's what we see some of the examples in the bible you can see right here, for example, the life of David. It says, when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. So here David was using money as a means to what? To build friendship. To have friends. To have friends. That's what Jesus is trying to say at verse 9. Right? Make friends for yourself by the unrighteous mammon. So that when you fail, when your life ended on this earth, that they, talking about those people who have gone before us, the converts, the believers, through your giving, people get saved. You know? And as a result of that, they'll be waiting on the other side to welcome you, to receive you into the everlasting life. And this is what we heard of concerning the testimony this morning, right? Because of the full fare, we gave, right? We buy, we bought the food. As a result, we are enabling these eight youth, plus the pastor, plus Brother Aaron, to go to such places, to preach a gospel. So when these people get saved, we don't know what's going to happen down the road. 10 years from now, 20 years from now, one day they're going to be there. From this one person, maybe he has led many more. And these people are going to be there in heaven 
to greet you and to greet me. I also thank God during the past years, our church actually involved in what? Church planting in eight countries. And as a result of that, uh, we have more than 100 over churches today. But personally, I don't know all these 100 over churches in all these eight places. All right? Some already independent. But out from there, imagine if there's one church, you just take an averagely one church, if let's say they have uh, maybe an attendance, a membership of 50 people, plus their children, plus the youth, 50 people, averagely speaking, if you times it with 100, you get 5,000 people. Am I right? And from there, they can still reach out to some more people. You see, those days when we do mission, when we gave to us, uh, gave to us mission, all those money doesn't go into thin air and then disappear. The result was churches were built. Yes. Even recently, there was one particular sister who sponsored one church in India, in Punjab, just given probably about 3,000 over ringgit to sponsor one particular church. Right? And as a result of that, a church you know, was birthed right there and the work is continued even to today. And we also heard about the Alpha course, am I right? And, you know, people contributed. I heard about, you know, the recent Alpha course this year, run by Pastor Kevin, Pastor Pam, uh, with Pauline, Fahin, Samuel, uh, all over there. Then, Alfred, <laughs> sorry. So, I heard, out of their own pocket, they sponsor the event, they, they did the food, they bought the food. And as a result, no doubt the seed has been sown. We don't see the, the souls, the literal souls, uh, come to know God. You know? But it's still okay. Why? Because you are sowing the seed of God's word. You never know what will happen down the road. Yes, it's like fishing, you know, fishing. You know, sometime today you fish, wow, you got one very big fish. And then, of course, maybe 10 smaller ones, you know. The next day, you might be thinking, I will get the same. You go there, the whole day you fish from morning until evening. You caught, you caught nothing. You catch nothing. It can happen. It's like what? Business investment, am I right? You invest, and as a result, you may not see the actual, you know, profit right there. So this is the same. This is what, you know, our Lord is trying to tell each one of of us. Now look at Philippians. Just to encourage you. When you give, you become part of that giving. Yes. It says here, Philippians 4.15. And as Philippians, and as you, Philippians, know, in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church but you partner with me in the matter of giving and receiving. Then Philippians 4, 16, 17 says, For even while I was in Thessalonica, you provided for my needs again and again. Verse 17, Not that I'm seeking for a gift, but that I'm looking for the fruit. Notice the word. That may, that may be credited to your account. You see, whenever we give, whether we give to the church, we give to an organization, to a para church, or to individual pastors, or to an evangelist, or to the missionary, your money doesn't go into nothing. Paul says, under the inspiration of God, whenever we give, what happened? It is credited to whose account? Your account. If you ask accountant today, Accountant, huh? people like Edwin Chong, or maybe people like Lemuel, you ask them, everything, the money goes out, comes in, they will tabulate it. Am I right? They will write it down. That's called account, accounting. And the same thing, you'll be surprised. 
Paul was telling the Philippian Christian. So when you give, it is credited to whose account? Your account. God take note of that. Because you have given. You have given. And you know, in heaven, there's a bank. Yeah, it's not UOB or OUB. Huh? It's what? H-O-B. Huh? H-O-B. Uh, bank of heaven. Uh, B-O-H, sorry. B-O-H. Bank of heaven. Yes, it's credited right there. So the first promise is that, what? Investment in friendship. Yes, because one day we're going to see all those converts that have been saved. Uh, through your giving, through the years, through the ministry, they're going to be there. Uh, waiting for all of us. That's what Jesus said. Uh, look at verse 9. And when you fail, that means when your life fail, they will receive you into the everlasting home. Aren't you glad? One day, that's going to happen. That's what Jesus said. Yes. So your giving, remember, it doesn't go into nothing. Number two, the promise number two, Jesus said, Found in verse 10. The importance of faithfulness. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 say, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And who is unjust in the least will also be unjust in much. Can you see? Basically, Jesus is trying to teach all of us on the issue of what? Faithfulness. Faithfulness. If you cannot handle something that is small, Jesus said, you cannot handle something that is bigger. So that means, whatever God has given to you, there is a small portion. If you handle it well, God is going to give you more. Yes. And this goes the same without giving. This goes the same without income. Am I right? If God has given you this amount, and you are very what? Stingy. You hold back. You dare not give. You think God will give you more? He won't. You need to be faithful in small first, in small things first, before God can give you bigger things. Now, when I was working for my father, uh, in a very small jeans factory, my father gave me a salary of 70 ringgit. That was way back in 1975. 70 ringgit. You say that is, that is quite a big amount. No, it's a small amount uh, compared to those days. 70 ringgit. You know what I did? Out of the 70 ringgit I received, I still pay my tithe. You believe it or not? I still pay my tithe. Even till today, I'm still paying my tithe. You see, a lot of people are struggling with tithing. Right? You say, how can I tithe? My tithe is big amount. Well, if you don't tithe now, later on will be even bigger. And you will have a big, big problem. Yeah, I remember one story. One person came to the pastor. He said, Pastor, can you pray for me? Sure, I'll pray for you. What do you want to be prayed for? I want to be blessed in my work. Pastor said, no problem, I can pray for you. So he was receiving probably 1,000, you know, ringgit. After praying for him, he got a new job, he got a great promotion. Then later on, he was promoted to, you know, a certain position and he received 5,000. So during the time when he was receiving 1,000, he tied, no problem, only 100. Now, 5,000 means 500. So he think twice, but he still gives. Then through the course of time, God begins to bless him. Now he's receiving a salary of 20,000. Then he say, Pastor, I really got a problem. When I receive 1,000, I give 100. No problem. When I receive 5,000, I give 500. No problem. But now my salary is enormous. 20,000. Now to give 2,000. Oh, Pastor, that is too much. I don't think I can commit myself. So, Pastor, pray for me. So, the Pastor said, what do you want me to pray for you? Pray for me, so that I know what to do. So, the Pastor said, okay, I pray for you. So, lay hand on him and pray for him. 
pass and I say what? God, I want to pray for this man. He had blessed this man so much. He had been faithful in small things. You know, giving his time. Now he has 20,000, you know, as his salary. He said now he cannot pay his tithe. So God, I pray, reduce his salary back to 5,000. Then the moment he say that, the man say, wait, 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 don't pray for me that one. You see, a lot of times, we are like that, isn't it? That's called faithfulness in small things. But if you're not faithful in small things, how can God give you bigger things? You see, that is what Jesus was trying to get at. Now, the same way we treat our children, don't we? We give our children pocket money. Right? We give them little bit by little bit. Am I right? Week by week. If they handle it well, we give a little bit more. Why? This is part of training. Part of training. We are training our children to be responsible. Then also in the house, we give them something to do. Am I right? Wake up in the morning, get ready for school, tidy up this shelf. I want you to do it. Tidy up this shelf. Vacuum the floor. Fold the clothes. Dry the clothes. We give them responsibility. Why? We are teaching them what? Faithfulness. And it's the same way to all of us. God is training us. If you're not faithful in small, small area, for example, if you're serving something, serving in certain area in the church, if a meeting is called, say, I'm not free. Or maybe a meeting is called, you're always late. That's called what? Unfaithfulness. You see, in the office, everybody, especially the CEO, the big boss, they are looking at the workers. What are they looking for? They are looking for faithfulness. Right? Rain or shine, do they come or not? Oh, raining, they still come. And they come on time. Some come early. That's good. But some came late. And they always give the excuses. Jam, la, raining, la, and so on so forth. And so and so forth. Am I right? What about the church? Sunday. If it's raining, what do you do? Some Christian will say, wow, that's a good time to sleep. After all, we can watch online. We can, it's a good time to sleep. Right? Rain, don't come. You see, sometimes our mentality got to change. When it comes to job, raining, we also go. When it comes to church, if it's raining, we stay at home. That's called the issue of faithfulness. That's why Jesus is trying to drive at, at verse 10. Then promise number 3 is what? Increase in favor. Look at verse 11. Jesus gave another lesson. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? See, see, there's an attachment right there. If you are faithful, Jesus promised He's going to give you the true riches. Now, what is the true riches? When you say riches, we understand. When you say material riches, we understand. What do you mean by the true riches? True riches means riches that you can buy with money. That's called what? True riches. Things that cannot be taken away from you. Only given by God. You say, what are the true riches? One of it is called favor. If you read the Bible, Luke 2, verse 50 or verse 52, he said, Jesus found favor in the sight of God and in the sight of man. Favor is something that comes from the hand of God. You cannot buy with money. Can you? You can't. What else is the true riches? One of it is, I call it grace. Grace is something that you cannot buy with money. It's given by our God. Some people have grace. Some people have more grace. Some people have extra more grace. Yes, grace is something that you don't earn. 
It is given by our Lord Jesus. What else is the true riches? Another one I can think of is called peace. Are you looking for peace? Where do you get peace? Yeah, take one pill will do. One pill. And the moment you take this pill, it's peace. No, we all know that. Peace is something that comes from the hand of God. Am I right? Am I right? What else is the true riches? Do you know what else is the true riches? It's called sleep. <laughs> Money cannot buy. You may be a rich person, rich man, but you cannot buy peace. I heard Brother Vince Wong. Huh? He says the moment his head touches his pillow, that, that goes huh, him. Uh, he will straight go us, uh, uh, into sleep. Well, sleep is a gift. God gives sleep uh, to his people. So here is what it says. If you are faithful in the unrighteous mammon, he will give you the true riches. Then number four, the fourth promise is found in verse 12. Look at verse 12. It says here, if you have not been faithful in what in another's man, who will give you what is your own? Now when you look at verse 12, it's kind of not very easy to understand. Now let me break it down. Verse 12. If you have not been faithful in what is another's man, talking about this particular steward, the money didn't belong to him. It belongs to the boss. So when it comes to our life, in our context, we are referring to what God has given to us. Everything comes from Him. It's not yours. It's His. It's Him. Huh? He's the one who gives you everything. So if you are faithful in what has been given to you, then the promise found in verse 12, it says, He will give you what is your own. To explain that is this. Now what we have, everything that we have, is all temporal. You can't take anything away from this earth. Even the money in your wallet right now doesn't belong to you. Say, Pastor, are you crazy or not? doesn't belong to you. It will flow out from your wallet. Either today, when come to lunch, or this week. It will go to the, probably to the car shop, uh, repair shop. Probably will go to the aircon. Probably will go to the grocery. Your money will keep going. Am I right? So the money is passed through many, 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 you can say millions of hands. Huh? Just passed through. In the course of probably months and years. Right? And when you die, it's also not yours. You may be keeping here, but the moment you die, it's not yours. It belongs to another. It belongs to somebody. Maybe your children. Maybe your spouse. Maybe we'll go to the social work. Maybe we'll go to the government. It's not yours. You come empty, you're going to live empty. Am I right? Right? And what is permanent? The permanent is the inheritance that God has given to you. That is permanent. Look carefully. Verse 12. Who will give you what is your own? Now listen carefully. One day, we will have what is our own. What is that? Let me give you a few examples. It can be rewards. It can be crowns. It can be other forms of things, right? Maybe mansion, dwelling place. Yes, Jesus said, if you are faithful in what has been given to you, the unrighteous mammon, what happened? One day, God is going to give you what belongs to you. Now, everything doesn't belong to us. It may seem like it belongs to us, but it's not. Right? One day, it's going to go. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell every believer. That one day, we are going to meet God. And what we are going to say? Are we going to be like this steward? A true steward, steward, knowing that his time is short, he has to give an account. One day he's going to meet the Lord. And what will God say? What do you think God will say to you? 
will you be one that, verse 1 says, wasting his goods? That means you get the resources and money that God has blessed you, but you only bless yourself. You take care of yourself. You enjoy yourself, but you never use it to bless others. Bless the kingdom of God. That's what it means. You see, the whole message that Jesus is trying to say is use money the right way. Because one day when we see God, uh, some people uh, will be so-called quote and unquote, uh, condemned by the Lord instead of being commended by the Lord. So if you are a wise steward, you will follow the story here in this parable that you make preparation. That whatever money now you have, don't just give it to yourself and spend only for yourself and squander the wealth just like the prodigal son only for himself and spend carelessly. But when you come to God, you're very, very, what? You're very, very stingy in your giving to God. But I know most of you, you're quite giving, but only probably a few. Uh, you hold uh, to your money so tight. And through the years, maybe you have been 30 years old Christian, your giving never increases. <laughs> I've increased my giving. I hope you increase your giving too. Because whatever we do, like what Jesus said from verses 9 to verses 12, has to do with the kingdom that is to come. Okay, one last point, very quickly. Now before I go to the one last point, look at this quote. Uh, this was said by Jim Elliot. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep. You break it down. It means like that. That means all of us cannot keep what God has given to you. So you are not a fool if you give it away. Because after all, those things that you have now, you cannot keep it with you for eternity. Then he says to gain. He's talking about heaven. To gain what you cannot lose. So in the end result of it is you gain when you meet God, when you see God. Okay, one last point very quickly is the principle in the parable. Look at verse 13. He said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will be loyal to the other one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So, Verse 13 is very straightforward. It all boils down to your love. Who do you love most? Is it God as a person? Or is it mammon, the thing? One is a person, a divine being, divine person, divine God. The other one, mammon, money, is a thing. So Jesus is saying to all of us, which one do you love? Which one will you serve? Which one will you be loyal to? And there's no so-called the second way. There's only one way. Either you choose either one, you cannot say, I serve both. No, you can't. You need to serve one. So what is inside your heart today? Is your heart to love God? If you love God, you will serve Him. You'll be loyal to Him. But if you serve money, if you love money, then you'll be devoted to money. So everything, when it comes to money, it will come first. Have you ever seen people, Christian, work on Sunday? Christian who work on Sunday. I do. I'm sure you do also. Why? Why people work on Sunday? Because of what? Obviously, money. Right? Correct? You ask them why you work on Sunday. Well, my job requires me to work on Sunday. You can't change it? No. I have to work on Sunday. It's a requirement. Sunday comes, I go to work. I say, can't you change your job so that you don't need to work on Sunday? Pastor, I can't. This is the only job I can. See? You're putting what? Money first. God second. True or not? If I were to be in their shoes, I'll make sure Sunday is free so that I can come to the house of God. 
Now look at the Bible very quickly. What did the Bible say? Exodus 20 verse 8 and verse 9. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9 says, Six days you shall labor. Nowadays only five days. <laughs> right? Five days. Six days you can work and, and labor and do all your work. That's what the Bible says. Six days. Now zero down to five days. Huh? Then verse 10 say, Exodus 20 verse 10 say, But on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. But Christian, today you go to Queen's Bay Supermarket and see Christian are working there. And you go to what? You go to Gurney Plaza. Same thing. Christian who believe in God, who were once upon a time very faithful to God, now working on Sunday. You understand? What did God say? In that seventh day, you shall do no work. Nor you, or your son, or your daughter, or your servant, the female servant, even your cattle, the stranger that is within your gates. In other words, make sure nobody works on Sunday. Make sure the animals also don't work. Give them rest. <laughs> That's what God was telling the Jews. Then look at verse 11, Exodus 20, 11. For in the six days, the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. What is God trying to say? He's trying to show the example. God is saying, I am God. I work for six days. I stop on the seventh day. That's why verse 11, he says, show, I'm showing you an example. You do the same. And look at verse 11. Therefore, the Lord blessed, look at the word, the Sabbath day, and hallow it and make it holy. You see, Sunday is the day that we come to the Lord and worship God. God never says, stay at home, watch online. No. Honor the Lord. That was those days. Huh? Then this one last verse. Jesus consigns the Ten Commandments into this Two great commandments. From ten, he consigns it, condenses it to these two verses or three verses. He says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first, look at the word, and the greatest commandment. Today, you ask yourself, do Christians sin against God? Yes. When? Right here. Sin against God by not putting God first in their Life. You ask husband and wife and see. When they married for years, and the husband always forget. Forget what? The wife's birthday, the wedding anniversary. What will happen? All hell will break rules. Am I right? Huh? Am I right? Huh? Right? When a man don't remember the special date of their wife, Oh, finish. Uh -huh. All finish. Right? Am I right? Can you imagine how God feel? On the Lord's day, that's the eighth day. Today we are worshipping God. And you look at Christian today. Where are they? Everywhere. Right? You can see unfaithfulness right there. Some even watch online much, much later. <laughs> Some didn't even watch. Huh? Some didn't even do devotion uh, on a daily basis. You see the slack right there, the backsliding. Since the COVID-19 happens, you know, people used to come to the church, but now people watch online. Uh, with coffee on the table, uh, shaking leg, uh, uh, watching, sometimes not watching. Uh, uh, and praising God, they never praise God. They all watch online. You see, that's why we encourage uh, people uh, to come to the church and worship God. Amen. Let's sing this one last song in closing. Okay. The song is very simple. We sang this song last week and I find that it's very, very nice. And let us sing this song again uh, for closing.
only unto you, O Lord. You alone are worthy to be praised. We gather together to magnify your name. Thank you for this parable. We thank you that you are teaching all of us that we are your stewards today. Help us to be good managers. To manage all those things that you have given to us. Be it big amount, 
small amount. Teach us to be faithful. Amen. Teach us to be grateful. Amen. Lord, we thank you for blessing us. Amen. But yet we know from this story, it's not going to be the end because one day, just like every steward, you will ask them to give their accounts. Father, help us to use your resources, your money in the right way. To invest into your work. To invest into souls. To invest into mission. To invest in the life of the believers. Help us to be a blessing to one another. Help us to use the finance in that way because we know your word is true. And you will not pass away. Your word will remain forever. And what you say will take place. Lord, I want to be a good steward. I'm sure all of us, we want to be good stewards. After hearing your message, we know we can waste it. We can use it all for ourselves and not for others. Awaken us. Open up our eyes so that we can amend our ways. That we can change our direction. That we can change our focus. That we can change the way we look at the unrighteous mammon. That the people out there use it the wrong way. But we as believers, we will use the unrighteous mammon in the right way. So that it will bring glory to your name. At the same time, will bring souls to your kingdom. We thank you for this parable. And as we dismiss, as we leave here, be with us. Give us a great, great week ahead of us. Amen. We give thanks. We pray in Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. Everybody say, Amen. 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 Come on, thank you, Jesus. A big hand. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise your name. Come on, praise Him. Praise Him. Open up your mouth and praise Him. Thank Him. Thank Him. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen.